Hey folks, thank you for stopping by uh, Kaiser's Castle. Uh, what you just got done hearing is Inside Enemy Headquarters by Axion Ghost, a friend of mine who uh, I treasure. And uh, here we all are right now. We're going to interview somebody by the name of Richard Shaw. A lot of you may not know who he is. He is the producer, director, and cinematographer for Watcher series. Uh, a hell fellow well met. This man has put it all out there. Not just Watcher series, the Torah codes, and uh, I consider him a friend, and I think he feels the same way. And. I think this is a discussion that you guys will all enjoy. So with that being said, hi Richard, how you doing brother? Man, it's, it's great talking with you Kaiser, thanks for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure and priv privilege, honestly. Um, as you guys may know, uh, some of the more read into it, uh, Richard, him and L.A., they were a component with the Watcher series. Uh, we're going to handle the Torah code thing, too. Which is, there's some interesting things, and I'm going to pull that up later on. But this gentleman, uh, he's into the weeds. He is bringing up <laughs> stuff that you would not believe. And with that being said, this is your show, brother. You uh, can... Uh, we both met, let me rephrase that. We both met on a show where I'm, I, I've got to give this intro. I was like, what's going on? I live in the Middle East. Most people know that. And I'm like, what's he talking about? Is he a liberal? Is he conservative? He's so vague. And uh, <laughs> so I get on and I basically am like, okay, are you coming from this? from a liberal perspective or conservative, and he still doesn't say it's not his point. He comes from it from a human realistic perspective is what I think. And, but he is, he is an American. He is a man with a voice and he will get to the truth. And that's the thing I do know about him. And it was a beautiful conversation we had and I'll let you run with it, brother. Well, it was great. I was on a, a show with Dr. J Radio Live, and I think we were talking about Hamas because I'd just been over to Israel and had visited 
a place called Sterot, which is right on the Gaza Strip. It's right on the border there with Gaza, and they've been bombed so many times by rockets and all of that. So after having hung out there and talked with people that are actually living by the border, it gives you a completely different perspective of what's really happening. Because there's so much crap on the internet about Israel, and it's most of it is not even true. And, of course, there's also the religious aspects on both sides of the fence, where it's it's uh, Jews and who are Orthodox, and then Christians who are huge Israel advocates, and then you've got the entire uh, opposite direction, where you've got leftists that think Israel is full of Zionists, all doing evil things. And I mean, it's gotten worse this past year. I, I'm I'm sure you'd probably agree. <laughs> Some of it makes absolutely no sense, but the people that talk about it uh, rarely have had any actual experience over there like I have. So, you know, I'm just trying to set the record straight. And you came on as a as a phone caller on that show and said something like, if I remember, it's been a few years ago now, but I mean, I think you said something like, everything that Richard's telling you is the truth. <laughs> no, uh, you're exactly right, man. Um it, which I really appreciated. I've lived there. Um, I've lived there for a long time, you know, during my life. And I'm 50, and it's a quarter of my life. So figure that one out, folks. Yeah. Uh, the Near East. I've been to Israel. Uh, our unit was actually the people that gave security to the uh, to the Dagon. Uh, uh, what were they called? Patriot missiles at that time that were delivered. To oh, Iowa. right. Yeah. The Iron Dome. Yeah. Well, no, it was an Iron Dome back then. It was Patriot missiles. And this is during the first Gulf War. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. And I don't know if they had Iron Dome that long ago. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't at all. And But we were the ones who delivered it to Haifa. Uh, gave the security. Let me rephrase that. The Air Force actually. Yeah, well, that was the time it. when yeah. Saddam Hussein was firing Scud missiles into Israel. Yeah, Al Hussein missiles were flying like they were water in the sky. Yeah, that's a fact. But yeah. the, the interesting part was we both agree that Israel as a nation has a right to re exist. Period. Uh, we also, I think, agree that Israel has a right to defend itself. But as Americans, so do we. And that's the beautiful thing is, this is why I consider him a hell fellow well met, is that he's as American as apple pie, just like I am. His name's Richard Shaw. Um, he is a good man. And you guys need to look at some of his productions including the Torah code because some of that stuff is off the chain with facts <laughs> go into that brother well it's it's really fascinating if you want to talk about the Torah codes up front here um, the way I got involved with it and I've told this story before but in case your listeners don't know um, back in the late 90s I was working on a pilot TV show with um, my partner David and we flew out to LA we were we had a, a company in Atlanta at the time called Z post and we were staying at Merv Griffin's hotel in Beverly Hills and we were having meetings with writers and directors out here and one of the folks that we met with was writing for touched by an angel which was a really popular show in the late 90s and early 2000s and uh, this guy came on television early in the morning is and his name was Michael Drosnan and he was pitching his book uh, that had been released I think it was released in 1997 but we were out here like in I guess it was 99 and I got really intrigued with what he was talking about and went out and bought the book. It was called The Bible Code and read it on the plane flying home. And I'm going, this is 
just unbelievable. And in that book, it talked about Professor Eliyahu Rips and some of these other guys who had figured it out mathematically that there was a code running through <clears throat> the first five books of the Old Testament. So I was really intrigued with it, but I didn't know what to do with that information. I was working on other projects at the time, didn't have any money to invest in a Torah code documentary. And didn't know how I'd ever meet these guys. Well, my friend Lee comes over, and we were working on another show called The Words Project, W-O-R-D-Z. It was some rappers that we were working with in L.A., really great guys. And um, he said, what kind of show would you want to do next? And I said, I don't know. I was really intrigued with this whole Bible code phenomenon. And, and that was about it. We just kind of talked about it briefly, how intriguing it all was and how mathematical it was. So it wasn't like people were just making this stuff up. It was actually coming out of the Bible, but only in the Torah, the first five books. So he gets on a plane. He was producing a concert in Tokyo for Ricky Lee Jones, comes home after a couple of weeks and gets on a plane to fly to New York to visit his brother Paul, and the flight's canceled. So he, has, he goes back a couple of days later and gets on, and it was jet blue, and, and the seat assignment put him next to this guy that looked like a rabbi. Now, this is, none of this was planned. This just kind of happened. <laughs> I'm telling you really what went on here. It still kind of boggles my mind when I just relate it to others because it's so weirdly coincidental and it makes you think that, you know, Kaiser, like, there are no coincidences in life. Things are kind of ordered uh, for us to do certain things. Well, this guy that he was sitting next to turned out to be Professor Robert Herlick, who teaches at City University in New York and who also was writing algorithms for searching the Torah and happened to know Professor Eliyahu Rips and Rabbi Glazerson and Art Levitt and Harold Gans and all of the the world experts in the study of searching the Torah. So they land in LaGuardia and Lee calls me all excited and he goes, Rick, I got someone here that you got to talk to. I think you're really going to want to talk to him. And he passes the phone over and, and, and it's this guy very soft spoken. Hi, this is Robert Herlick. And, and I didn't know who he was in those days because no none of the books I'd read mentioned him. And then I realized that this guy was uh, one of those super geniuses like you read about. <laughs> and he really is. I mean, he uh, had worked in black ops at one point. He had designed uh, compression systems for... Uh, satellite transmission from space before we had JPEG. He and a team of other folks were working on image compression. Um, he's a brilliant scientist and also was totally into searching the Torah for hidden things. And all of a sudden, I was connected with with all the world experts, had their phone numbers, email addresses, and I didn't know what to do with it. And so I, I did uh, a piece, and I uh, put it up, and nothing happened. And then I spoke at a convention. This was way later in, in 2014. And this guy comes up afterwards, and, and uh, it was David Greenhill, and asked me how much money I needed. And I told him, he said, oh, that's not a problem, and wrote me a check. And that's how the Torah Code film got funded we needed a little extra money, and we did like a uh, – it was a, one of those like a GoFundMe type of thing. But we raised another couple thousand dollars because we were a little bit short. I mean, that's not much money to put together a film anymore. And um, didn't put any money in there for my own salary or anything. It was just to make the movie and went to Israel and did it. And since then – I get emails from all of these guys pretty much on a daily basis, especially from Rabbi Glazerson, um, with information on what's coming out. And one of the most intriguing tables that I've seen in a long time 
came from Professor Rips, who did a table about Comey and the Clinton Foundation. And it was it was so frigging amazing from a mathematical standpoint that I've talked about it a lot, but I still feel like it's it's truly an incredible table because uh, it, for for those of you who don't have any idea what I'm talking about, the uh, a table I've is seen ba- this. I've seen this, and folks, you need to listen to this because just like the Bible code, the Torah code has something to it, and I I mean that. Yeah, it's it's really incredible. It's definitely encoded. the The way it works is through ELS, which stands for equidistant letter sequencing, and basically, um, it's all in the original Hebrew text. Um, people say there's a code throughout the entire Bible, but that there's no real evidence of of uh, the same kind of codings coming up in other books, just in the Torah where you get these tremendously complicated sentences that could not be just misconstrued as as pure uh, coincidence. And the one that I, I think is so incredible is, is the Comey table. And I'm glad you got to see that because to me it's just it's just absolutely incredible because of of the way that it, it all of the information comes out. I'm just pulling it up just so that I don't forget something important to tell you. But essentially, the way these tables look, they look like a crossword puzzle. And the programming that does that was designed by uh, Dr. Rotenberg. Before that, they all came up as, as numbers because when computers were first available to these men back in the late 70s, Um, There were no Hebrew fonts or anything like that. So each letter in the Hebrew alphabet was converted to a number, and then the numbers were fed into the computer, and then all of their answers came back as a string of numbers, which to me sounds incredibly confusing. But to Professor Rips, it was very simple. So basically, they would get their answers back in a string of numbers, and then they would have to uh, make the Hebrew characters that corresponded to each number that came back after they got their answer from the computer. So in the late 80s, early 90s, Professor Rotenberg or Dr. Rotenberg designed this way of of a graphic sense of being able to look at these tables and it it really revolutionized the whole process of looking up Torah codes because then you could visually see associations of different names, how close they were together, the compactness of other names and all of that. So the incredible thing about it is that all of these sentences and other stories are embedded in the stories that we've all read in the Torah. If any of you have studied the uh, the first five books of the Old Testament or have read them before, you know, there's stories in there like like the creation of Earth in the book of Genesis, the giants in Genesis 6, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Joseph that had dreams. And, I mean, you guys that have been to Sunday school and probably remember some of this stuff. And then in Exodus where Moses rescues the Israelites from the Pharaoh and parts of the Red Sea and all of this stuff happens. All of those stories that we read, there are codes embedded that runs through all of them. And this is not like some kind of weird cult or some kind of occultic thing. It's just it's just math. You can take these letters and you put them in a computer. You type in a word that you want to look for and the computer tells you how many times that word is embedded in the Torah and the number of spaces between the letters as far as skips between each letter. It's and it sends, gives that to you as a list. The interesting part is it's nothing but cold metal rhythm, an old song from back in the 90s, and that is zeros and ones. It's mathematical. 
Yeah, and, it, it's totally. I mean, you get down to the machine language part yeah. of it. Yeah, it is. But I mean, but we're dealing with what was astonishing to everybody. We're we're dealing with really inside information of current events that happened thirty three hundred years after the Torah was written. Which is very strange, because then you have to wonder, all of these other ideas pop into your head, like, well, are we really living in a digital simulation? You know, Elon Musk thinks we are. Well, I'd, I wouldn't say that. What I will say, first I gotta throw something out there. Horace McPorris, not a coincidence. Um, it's not a coincidence. Everything comes at the time it's supposed to come. Um yeah. Val said something that was very prescient. I must say something. 2020 Trump. You know, MAGA, CAGA. I get that. But all that stuff in the Torah codes, it's it's kind of funny because I got let into this a while back <clears throat> thanks to my friendship with uh, Richard. And that's his name and uh, Richard Shaw he's got the inside loop on this and and the Bible code actually sometimes confirms a lot of this stuff so you know it's not about just being Hebrew or Christian it's about this stuff's overlapping folks and I'm gonna shut my mouth because this is about Richard not about me <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I appreciate your comments. I, I think what, what we're what's really coming out here is that there's high technology involved in this book. For it to be able to do this, someone had the knowledge of how to encode it, and you know, Christians or Jews would say it. Well, God did it, and and that's. And and I don't leave out that possibility, but I'm just saying there's a physical uh, thing that happened here with this book that we're just discovering now. And the Torah was given in such a mysterious way. Uh, you could call it an angelic way. In fact, even in the New Testament, when Stefan was being stoned, he said that, Basically, the Torah was given to you by angels, and yet you have not followed it. So, to me, that was kind of a huge clue when I read that, was given to you by angels. Now, this is a guy who was only a few hundred years past the Torah, not 3,000 years like we are. So, for him to say that, there's a lot of people that believe that if we saw an angel today, we would say it's an alien, or we would you know i'm i'm and i'm not trying to be sacrilegious here i'm just trying to to say that there is a reality here that we have to embrace as being real and not just fictional or not sci-fi but this these things actually exist and we have evidence of it that this is happening and the comey table if i can just describe that and i think maybe you've put that up on your website i haven't checked yet uh kaiser but What's interesting about this table yes, is that it's in, it's in complete sentences, and the first line of text is with a skip of 513 characters and says, Comey covers up. Now, this is referring to Comey, the former head of the FBI. The Four next line four. over, yep. yeah, the next one line over from that. Also, with the same skip of 513 characters, now think of the phenomena of this. It says, for the male. Yep. Then, next to that, skipping one line vertically and, and moving to the left again, are two sentences that are joined together, and it basically, it, it basically is, is talking about the uh, making use by their foundation. Yeah. Now those are are two sentences, and each of the fragments of those sentences have five hundred and thirteen character skip. Yeah. And you do the math on it and bring it out to a certain number. 
it's it's absolutely amazing folks just with this just with the Comey thing it proves he's a liar it proves everything that Trump said about Hillary we all know Mueller is full of you know what he's full of um, it's very important that folks you need to look at this stuff because there's always truth and it's always like was said earlier there is no coincidence and there is not and there isn't in fact the the top code that kind of all of these other codes fall under is the word Hillary and and what's kind of significant about this depending on how these codes are put in uh, as far as the ELSs determines if they're horizontal or vertical and all of that and sometimes it doesn't matter the names are spelled forwards or backwards it's still the name like if I could spell uh, your name you know R E S I A K and it would still you'd know what it was well Hillary is spelled with a skip of a negative two and it so it's backwards but only only two characters between letters which is just like more than coincidence I mean you could find it without a computer if you knew where to look and it says Hillary so Hillary is at the top of the page and all of this stuff about Comey and and the Clinton Foundation and all that falls below but then what's really interesting is there's almost and, and I've talked with Robert Herlick about this before in some cases, there seems to be a three-dimensional aspect to the tables. And I know before you all roll your eyes and, t and go, oh, he's making this up. It, there is something going on here that we don't understand because this is so much beyond our ability. And, and Herlick once told me, he said, you know, this is the hardest thing I've ever done is to try to figure this out. <laughs> he's the guy that, you know, writes code for computers and they have a cray at the university that he puts some of this stuff through which is like many many cores processors they have to try to figure this stuff out but splayed out over making use by their foundation is the word servers now for that for these words these modern hebrew words to be put in to a 3,300-year-old text is really bizarre. But they're in there, and it's meaningful. And the word servers comes up with a skip that if you multiplied uh, 513, which is the skip of, of, the other, uh, uh, of the other sentences in there, it, it ends up being like like 513 times 3, which is really something because the word servers is spread out over that sentence making use by their foundation, and it ends up being 1,539 characters, which is 513 times 3. Yep. So and the mathematical precision in this is, is just beyond belief. It's perfect. And the thing... People don't see. I, I've got to throw a couple shout outs. First, Jermaine Arminius. Uh, he is from Germany. And he said, Hey, br hi, bro. And to you, Rich, Richard Shaw. I will enjoy your show. Big up from Germany. Uh, very Great. Good, very good brother from a long time ago. And still a brother cool. today. And uh, he said, Mrs. H, meaning Hillary, is a children eater. And uh, it sucks that they can run around <clears throat> and children biz in government. And here's the thing that boggles me. I know, there's some you... terrible stuff coming out about yeah. the whole pedophile thing. Oh, it's, it's like, it's, been coming it's out. really horrible. It's been coming out and it's horrible and we've talked about it. Uh, but the basic genesis of what I'm trying to say is that 3,500 years ago, and then 2,000 plus years ago for Christianity, all this stuff was talked about. And 
the thing is these codes these things that people are talking about now are very relevant and that's the important part and I, I and I think a lot of people don't understand how important that part is um, and that's why I will shut my mouth again <laughs> you go on brother because I'm well, telling you these folks <laughs> don't get they don't get uh, there's some truth that needs to come out and I'm not that guy to do it and I will bring on guys that can well it's what's fascinating is and, and I've I, I heard this before because I was talking with um, Jim Barfield who's an expert on the copper scroll and that's a whole another topic but uh, he has a book out and there, there's a uh, a comment made in his book that churches tend to preach the same 30% of the Bible over and over and over and ignore the rest of it. <laughs> and I, I mean, that's why attendance is down. That's why no one's interested and everybody's bored with church because the cool stuff that makes the Bible really worthwhile is the stuff that I'm trying to study. And because every stuff church. Like this. Every church in Christianity has been co-opted. The only church in Christianity that has not been co-opted, and you have to go place by place, is Orthodox Church. And then that brings us to another level with the Orthodoxy and the liberal fasc uh, uh, the liberal side of uh, Judaism, and. Of well, yeah, just like that we have the left here orthodox. in America. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. No, you didn't talk over me. I said it's the same thing with orthodoxy and Judaism and the liberal side of Judaism. It's the same thing. Yeah, what I was going to say is there's a leftist side here in America and there's leftists in Israel trying to undermine the government there. And they do that by attacking Netanyahu and all of that, just like they're attacking Trump in America. I mean, it's, it's, it's an onslaught daily of just stuff that, you know, yep. it's, some of it is just ridiculous. But that's what the media covers, and the media, media has become completely infiltrated with leftist thought to the point where most people don't believe it anymore because it's just so biased. So that's why we have to do our own reporting and just basically show the proof of it. And I try to stay, steer clear of politics. And the only reason I have this table is because Professor Eliyahu Rips, who I deeply admire and respect, who was really the guy who spearheaded the Torah code research from the beginning in 1976 when they started on it. Um, I have a huge amount of respect for him and he loves America. And I had sent him uh, a string of information that I pulled off the, the internet, which I thought was interesting, which apparently was, a uh, an FBI agent that was cloaked, wouldn't give his name or anything, but allowed normal people to ask him questions. And he was responding with answers that I thought were honest. And I sent that whole string to Professor Rips, and he came back with these tables to prove that it was. And some of the tables talked about Trump, and some of them talked about assassination attempts on Trump, and all of that is in... Uh, the website endtodarkness.com and if you click on the Trump link it'll take you to all those Trump tables and so Trump is comes up quite often in the Torah codes next to the word Cyrus well, into which darkness, is really quite interesting into dark, into darkness com and pinlight.com they're right. both linked in the description so, folks, you ain't got to write it down. I did that for you because this is important information. And Richard Shaw, 
like I said, he's a hell fellow well met, and I think you guys will all grow to appreciate Richard Shaw. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. So, anyway, uh, what's interesting is is Cyrus, who was a king who liberated the Israelis at the time and brought them back to their homeland, uh, helped them rebuild their temple because it had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, all this is like biblical historical fact. It wasn't just a story. These things actually happened. So the first temple was built by King Solomon. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then a few years later, uh, Israel was released. Uh, King Cyrus kind of took them under his wing and helped them get back to their homeland, and they built a new temple. And that temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. But so now they're getting ready to build a third temple. And there's a lot of international news that has come out about that. And with Trump making Jerusalem the capital of Israel again and promoting that idea, um, everybody's starting to talk about the, the third temple again. And, and I have lots of friends over there that are feeding me information about this. And I won't go into all of it on this particular show, but there's stuff happening over there. I mean, there's really incredible stuff going on that that they're doing and uh, artifacts that they're looking for and that, that I've been involved in as well. And all of these things are kind of coming down. But one of the things I thought that your uh, listeners might be interested in is, is the Watchers series, since you mentioned it up front. And what that's all about, of since course. we cover some of this of stuff in it as well. Um, so there's this there's this series that I worked on with L. A. Marzuli, and it's it's called Watchers. Uh, he contacted me in 2010 and asked if I would direct a show about UFOs with them. And and knowing LA's experience in this and his connections and he had been studying it for years, I I agreed to do it. We had a really tiny budget and it was kind of a scary thing to agree to do because I didn't know where I was going to get footage and make something that was even halfway professional up to the standards that I would expect a video to look like. And it had to be an hour long. Well, it ended up being 52 minutes. That's just about as much as I could squeeze out of the budget we had. And it was called The Watchers because we didn't know we were making a series. That wasn't our intention at the time. And the buzz line was, UFOs are real, burgeoning, and not going away. And <clears throat> it begins with an overview of the UFO phenomena. We talk about UFO sightings, uh, orbs, which are little balls of light that people photograph quite frequently and continue to do so today. Cattle mutilations where strange things are happening to cattle uh, in fields or even the coyotes won't come eat off of their carcasses once this has happened to them. Um, and, and how all this references into ancient texts and then we we ended the first show with a, a really in-depth interview with Dr. Roger Lear, who I met for the first time uh, doing this show. And actually, I have to tell you that I was skeptical of the whole alien implant story. It, to me, that was going a little farther than right. I remember you what I was that. willing to yeah. – you know what I mean? And, but I was going to be open-minded about it because, you know, if you believe that there are UFOs, and, there, and of course there's no question about it, they've been photographed thousands of times, and yes, a lot of them are fake, a lot of them are done in After Effects and Photoshop and stuff like that, and a lot of them are poorly done, but then there's a whole bunch of them that are real, and being a filmmaker myself, I can usually kind of tell 
if something's fake or real. And I can see that there was a lot of real stuff out there, real stuff. And so what do we do with that? Do we ignore it or do we try to look into it and see if we can discover what's really going on there? And I, I really like Roger. He was a great guy. Unfortunately, he passed away in March of 2014. But between the time that I first met him and then we became really good friends, he'd come to my house, we would talk about all sorts of stuff. And I held an implant in my hand, and we had taken two implants at various times over to SEAL Labs in Los Angeles, which is close to LAX, and did electron microscopy on it, and also um, EDX, which is Energy Dispersant X-ray Spectroscopy, which basically what that does, it when you have something in the chamber of the electron microscope and you pump all the air out of the chamber and you have a sample in there that you're looking at, it's basically electrifying this sample. Certain things will be destroyed by that much electricity, but implants are metal, so they, they held up just fine. So we'd put stuff in there and, and in every case, when we were examining these things, they had nearly the same elemental structure. Uh, many of them had visible nerve endings from the body that were still attached to them. Those came up as 99% carbon in the EDX spectrum analysis, which means that there's human tissue. Um, the actual body of the implant itself was a combination of, of iron and nickel, uh, yeah. sometimes some titanium in there. And what what this ended up being at, at the same percentage as uh, meteoric particles have, which is not from this earth, they're from space. Um, so that's how you can tell if you're... Yeah. If you have a metal or just looking at this material, and I'm sure because you're such uh, an expert on weaponry and all of that stuff, there there's a, a way to to look at the this output of of the SEM and determine it, well is this a nail that this guy has under his skin from Home Depot? Is this a bicycle scope? You know, piece of a bicycle spoke from a Schwinn bike? Well, all those things. You could analyze that and know immediately what it where it came from because we have that kind of technology now. Yep. Here's the interesting thing: Jermaine Arminius piped up and said, and and uh, Val said something too. Bad thing is that we know the end game is close. How much evil things still can do. I hope it's not World War Three. That's hers. And then Jermaine brought up something that's very true and uh he goes back to our natural roots it works pretty well what he means and i know this man uh from a long time ago uh he he is a great guy uh, none of you guys well i guess some of you have heard him on my channel uh germaine <clears throat> understands that it is our past that predicts our future and one of the things that's so beautiful when people talk about the past, the Torah codes, the Bible codes, uh, the ancestors, all the things that they can talk about, what they fail to realize is that there's nothing new under the sun. That's biblical, torical, and ancestral. That means it's all happened before. This has happened. We live in an echo. History does not repeat. It echoes, and that's my two cents. Yeah, well, that's that's true, and there's some believe. I know, like the late uh, Dr. Chuck Misler, who was also working in the Air Force at one time in black ops and couldn't talk about all the stuff he knew, uh, thinks that we're living in a digital simulation. And that's come out recently. Elon Musk said it's one in a billion chance if we're not living in a digital simulation. And it's there. There is a um, an article that's out on YouTube, which is 
really technical, very scientific. It gets into quantum theory and everything else, but it kind of proves how the use of light, how light is a wave and not a particle, even though they're, it's made up of photons. Um, the way that that our reality exists is so weird and so much like video game programming that it's starting to make people look at it and go, oh, well, okay. And then you get into these people. I mean, then, I'm sorry to be diverging here a little no, bit, but not. this is kind of like watchers a little bit. Yeah, you're not. You're not diverging because I'm, I'm there with you right now. What I guess what I'm getting at is that I see all of these disparate events as being tied together by this strange what what we re- kind of refer to as being supernatural because we don't have another term for it and I don't even like that term anymore because I think all of this is so it's so provable and so scientific now and as we get as we get into quantum computing I mean they're doing stuff at at CERN right now where their computer is able to send messages into an alternate dimension. I mean, this is stuff that I've read. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I wouldn't, I really wouldn't doubt it because we know that these dimensions exist. And as far as UFOs, we see them flying across the sky and they suddenly disappear. Well, where'd they go? And they're proving strangelets. They're proving all this stuff. And uh, Arminius brought this up. Echo is on point echoes of our gods and that's something that in modernity I think we've lost he thinks the same thing and I I believe in the end you believe the same thing is we're when we allow ourselves to sexualize our children when we allow ourselves to change the dynamics between man and woman when we allow ourselves to diverge created divergence between humanity and animal, there's an issue. And I think that's the crux and I and I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I agree. I mean it's basically trying to break down the uh, norms of how we were originally created and what we're supposed to be doing. And, and, and this is not to criticize people who have uh, are confused about their own gender. I mean, I, my heart goes out to those folks. But the problem is, and, and what I heard a rabbi say, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm of the Christian faith. I believe in Yeshua as being the answer to all of these things, but yet I don't discount the wisdom that I hear from also my rabbi friends. And until I started working on the Torah codes, I didn't even know if a rabbi would ever become such close friends as I now have. And we have incredibly deep discussions now about these things. And he want, you know, I get questions like, what do Christians think about this? And I say, well, what does an Orthodox rabbi think about this? And we, we're really not that far apart on so many of these issues. People don't realize that. But, you know, there's – I know Glazerson often talks about that there's a, a spiritual world and the physical world hiding the spiritual world. And that someday that will be ripped away. And there's scriptures in the Bible that we have to start taking a totally different look at with different eyes – because now we're seeing how this could possibly be. We need to read these scriptures with kind of a scientific bent to it, as if, you know, what is the prophet who doesn't know how to explain this in a technical attributes like a quantum physicist would say or a particle physicist would explain it. But what is he trying to tell us when he says, and the sky will roll back as a scroll? What's that all about? <laughs> and then I have a rabbi telling me that, oh, yeah, the, uh, well, the, the physical world's hiding the spiritual world. And then once early on in my discussion with Glazerson, and, and really 
I appreciated his our discussions so much because he thinks so far outside the box on these things. And really, I've had Christians think that we're totally uh, out in the weeds here with this stuff. And I'm going, no, this is like what scriptures are trying to explain well, to us. And we have to get what we can out here, of it. Here's my thoughts. If you want to look to the gods, i.e. the ancestors, if you want to look to Christianity, if you want to look to, you know, the Jewish thing, I'm all good with that as long as everybody understands there is a point in what you said is so true. Here's what I believe. I believe that there's a knowing within all of us. That there's a... We all have a link spiritually to something. And that spiritual link means everything and yet in modernity because these cheap plastic goods these computers all this stuff we're using this as a vehicle right now but modernity has corrupted it and has corrupted our societies and the basis is faith family and community and nationalism, Israel has nationalism. America should have nationalism. Germany, Austria, uh, we can go down the line to every nation. Africa, all these different uh, continents. Every state, if they believe in their nationality, should have that nationality. And should fight for it and not run from it and act like... Uh, I'm not going to, I'm trying not to. Well, you're, hours. you're actually right. And it, what you're saying is leading into the point that I was about to make when I first met Rabbi Glazerson. And I guess maybe our second day together, he was over at my studio that I used to have in Hollywood up on the second floor of the Max Senate stage. And I don't know, we got to talking about the flood of Noah and how that factors in to a bunch of things. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, if you get into Jewish mystical texts, they believe that that a star from Orion came very close to the Earth at that time. Now, of course, it wouldn't have been a star, but it could have been a planet. So most of my rabbi friends believe in the planet X philosophy as being real, and what that's what caused the flood. Well, then we got talking about. The idea of the uh, Tower of Babel, and there's a lot of issues there too. I mean, there's Nimrod, and there's all these people, and they all banded together, and they all spoke one language. And if you remember what happened, they all their language was confused because God didn't want them all to form a single one-world government. You know. Is really what it came down to. It is. And when I asked him what the tower was for, and he he. On his own volition, before we ever started talking about UFOs, because I really, I was kind of afraid to even broach the topic with him because it seemed like a kooky thing to ask him. But he said, "Oh, the Tower of Babel was a launching platform for space vehicles." That, and and that, then at that point, the cat's way out of the bag. It is, <laughs> and and what blew me away, Richard, when we were talking. Look, you guys are getting like every time I bring a brother on. You guys get, these conversations happen all the time with me, with brothers. <laughs> okay, am I lying, Richard? No, and, it's true. And, and, and the funniest part about this, that I will tell you on the real, um, I've been to Iraq, I've been to Afghanistan, I've been to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I've been to all these places and, and, and it's not my fake. It's not, I'm lying. It's Israel, all these places. What I do know is that two things I do know. I, Saddam was recreating the tower of Babel. That's a fact in 05, 06, I've driven past it. Also the walls of Nineveh, in Mosul, I drove past what still exists of those walls. There were still existing parts was, of those was walls. Was this before the ISIS attack in yeah, Mosul? It was, yeah, it was. Uh, 
was 05, uh-huh. 05, 06. Okay. Um, I drove past them, and it got me to thinking, God, in the Bible and probably in the Hebrew thing, I, you know, I'm not a Jew, so I don't know these things. But the thing that I do remember from the Bible is God did not destroy the Garden of Eden. He just posted angels so that no human could ever enter into it again, which to me in my finite mind, I don't have an infinite mind. I have a finite mind just like every other human on this planet. And what that means is that is such a thin space now because it's supernatural that I have probably drove through it and it was pretty cool to think about that I drove through it and out of it in a blink of an eye and that means I can never see what we see uh, from from the Garden of Eden. I believe it still is in Mesopotamia. I don't believe it was destroyed because the Bible didn't say it was. And I don't Well, this the this is why there are some apocryphal texts and and that's a, a kind of a, a $50 word, but basically what that means is there's there are texts that we don't have anymore that aren't in the canon of the Bible. <clears throat> there were a lot of texts that were removed back in 325 AD by the Council of Nicaea that what we have is, and even the book of Revelation was up for grabs, whether that would be in the Bible or not. They just weren't sure about it. So you have these other texts. One of them was the books of Enoch. Uh, another one was called the life of Adam and Eve. There's one uh, on the life of Jesus when he was a young child, stuff that we don't have in the Gospels and the New Testament. Um, and, and I'm not trying to wax super religious here. I'm just giving you historical information here for people who don't believe any of this stuff. But in the in the life of Adam and Eve, it talks about the, the garden, as you're referring to. <clears throat> and the way they describe it in that particular text, which I've read, makes it sound like it was in a different dimension and flowing down onto the earth. And Adam begged God to take some seeds from the garden so that they could still have the same foods and beautiful plants that he was used to uh, as he's walking through the Garden of Eden. And he was allowed to go in one more time and grab those things, according to this book. That's what it says which maybe is why some of the things on the earth are so beautiful. And if we didn't have those things, then... And so what's, what's happening right now? The powers that be are... We have GMO. It's by design. It's by yeah, design. It's, it's, it's to ruin anything that God Made. put together yeah. initially. Yeah. It's, it's clear to that's DNA. I mean, yeah. messing with you know, combining elements... <clears throat> genetically so now there's you can't go anywhere without eating genetically modified corn it's all gmo corn pretty much yeah because it blows all the spores all the all the all the stuff that god made to make it pure it's now blowing and everything's registered with their dna and, right and and they're doing the same thing to us i mean this is getting kind of kooky on my part but i do believe at a certain point and there's a reason for that i mean you and i talked about it offline but digital angel is a real thing uh they tested it on oda special forces all this stuff those little pin pricks most people i know cut that shit out afterwards uh, but they're now trying to say we don't you're um, because I might use my wife's or she might use my card my debit card well no we gotta implant that in your skin it's getting to the point yeah we're where very the, close to that yeah, very close very close brother and <clears throat> I didn't want to go down this path because it, it goes, but but 
I agree with this. Well, it's predicted yeah, it that is. everyone would have to take a mark and it yeah. would, you know, this is this is like we can see, you know, at first it's like, well, a mark, what does that mean? And and now we find out that there's they can imprint sort of a barcode on your skin like a tattoo that's that's not visible. It's like only visible under ultraviolet light. Like when like years ago when I was a kid and you'd go to Disneyland out here in Anaheim, California. And if you wanted to leave the park and come back, like go to your car to get something, they would stamp the back of your hand. And it was kind of fun because you could see it yep. under ultraviolet under light. Ultraviolet Remember that? Light. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And it was beautiful. Yeah, it was really cool. And then you could get back into the park without having to pay, you know, another hundred bucks to get back in again. Well, this this kind of technology uh, that they have now uh, with RFID chips and all that, and I don't know, I mean, I know like even, and you'd know about this more than me, but I know that the military's involved in it to try to find guys that get lost. I've heard that. And I had a guy uh, from Amsterdam uh, come to my studio once and and lay one of these chips on my desk. And it's basically about the size of a of a grain of rice and it's like a little yeah yeah, it's it's like a little glass tube with a coil of wire in it and and it's really quite simple the way it works i mean you get it near a field and it energizes itself and and then there's a chip in it with all of your information it's like a self-winding watch that we used to wear back in the 80s here's how old this techno is but it just got shrunk and so as we walk, we would wind that watch. And it's the same thing, but they have a specific place they put it. And this is where, biblically, it coincides. It's on the right hand, within the webbing of the finger from the thumb to... I've, I've seen that where yeah. they can like yeah. stick it under your skin there and, 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 and you just wave your hand over a sensor and yeah. they know who you are and what and your bank account is. Pay for everything. And people don't realize this stuff at the grocery store, the scanners, you can pay for your uh, items with it. Uh, I don't want to go deep into that because that goes into me bringing out my autism on this stuff because I know about it. Um, the more important <laughs> thing is is that, uh, look, Jermaine said something, and he said, and we are more now, and we survive and lead in peace for the gods. And he's very truthful on that. It's about our gods and about being honest with each other and family look number one's family folks believe me on this it's about family faith is second because without your family you will not have faith you will not stand if if i didn't have a family i'd be a whore i'd be out there doing the stupid shit i did when i was 20 (laughs) <laughs> um, trust me, I, I was a whore. I was a male whore. You know, if, if a girl looked good, I'm I'm going after her. It's horrible, <laughs> but I know what I was. It's about honesty too, with faith. And the last thing is about community. And it's real. And Richard is bringing you something that it may you may disagree with everything he says, but think about the reality because he just said everything that's true and your heart knows that is true your heart knows it you know it, it's just like this if you're doing something bad you get the butterflies if a fight's about to develop you get the butterflies in your stomach your heart skips beats whatever you want to call it you know and it's hardwired and guess why it's hardwired? Because there is the supernatural that exists, and it exists to this day. And I'm not going to go into the weeds on this. Trust me, folks. If you only knew, there's a reason why I'm speaking, and why I'm speaking with this gentleman, because he understands. 
And Germain said, yeah, it's the rulers of hearts. And anyways, I'll shut my mouth. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate the kind words there. I mean, it's, it's like after having worked on Watchers with L.A. Marzulli for nearly eight years, um, I've experienced a lot of things most people haven't. I mean, I just have. I mean, when, after after we did the first Watchers, the second one, we did it basically had a subhead signs in the heavens and the earth. So we start we started evaluating what was really going on. And there were strange things happening with the sun and the moon. People were saying the moon wasn't coming up in the same spot it always had been. Um, there was uh, universities studying the moon because they felt like something was going on with it. Um, recently, we've been told that the moon seems to be generating some sort of an atmosphere of its own. And people have seen little uh, cloud bursts on, on the moon where there's something coming up off the surface. We don't know what it is. And then uh, in Watchers 5, I think it is, we, we've done 10 of these episodes. Um I happened to run across this guy on YouTube that said he made this little device. He had a telescope, and uh, he, he had a – this was kind of a Rube Goldberg setup, but it, it worked really well for him. He had uh, one of those um, webcams on his computer, and he wanted to hook it up to his telescope. He got a toilet paper roll out and stuck the two things together and got it to look through the eyepiece and just sat it outside and recorded it digitally onto his computer. And as the moon was moving by, you know, the moon's always in motion, uh, there was this big crater that came by in his shot, and inside of it was a square building. And so I got in touch with this guy. I said, hey, I'd like to use that shot. And he said, yeah, no problem. So I gave him a credit for it. And it's in the film. But, I mean, this is like there's stuff that we're not being told that's, that's going on. There's They're building stuff up there. I don't know what all is going on. And they found strange artifacts on Mars as well. Now, whether we're actually on Mars or not, I don't know. But there's a lot of talk on the Internet just in the past year about the secret space program. And then Donald Trump comes out and says, yeah, we have a, we have a space force, but we that, actually broke that, that news in watcher seven in 2013. That is so important. There's been a space force, but I've heard so many people talk about it and they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, right. It, it blows me away that all of a sudden this is an issue that a space force is an issue um it doesn't mean people are flying off world all the time doing this doing that no what it means is now we have somebody that realizes we have a problem and he's actually being honest we're gonna see some stuff drop folks uh Bush Sr. Oh, I totally now. believe that. Within the next few weeks, oh, even. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bush Sr.'s dead now. So, the redacted stuff from the CIA for JFK is probably going to all get released. Uh, you're going to see the truth on what the NSA, and I'm putting myself out there on all of what I'm about to say. The NSA, the DIA, and the CIA did to put some fuckery afoot to Donald Trump. They tried to hamstring him. Look, Donald Trump, he's a lot of things. Look, I'm half German, I'm half Italian. Uh, the Italian side's Sicilian. I don't forget and I don't forgive. Um, Trump has had to deal with his world the way he had to. But it took a Manhattan... Democrat billionaire to make the Republican Party come to fucking hill. If you yeah. don't believe this, you folks better wake up. If you're on my page, especially, wake up. Because he's a Democrat. He's not 
he's an old school Democrat, and I've seen certain people counter signal me on this. And honestly, it irritates me, but I still love those people. Trust me, I, I don't hate <laughs> on them. I, I would characterize Trump as more or less like a JFK Democrat. Yeah, but but I've gotten counter signaled. Oh, he's nothing like JFK. He's and it's these people that swallowed the pill, because all they watch when they when they want to counter signal me, it's NPR, it's CNN. That all they do is want every. Well, all of those be. networks have they've become pure propaganda for the left, and I mean to, to the rest Indeed. of us. It's really obvious. It's like no one has to tell me that. I mean, it's like you listen to like five minutes of it and you go, well, that's a completely biased report. It's very political. It has nothing to do with just delivering the news. It's 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 like everyone's editorializing it. The news is the news is nothing more than when I was a cop. Pravda. Uh, no, the no, the news should always be nothing more than when I was a cop. Not editorializing. The editorial pages for that or somebody that says we're an editorial thing on radio or on the internet, whatever. I'm, what we're doing is editorializing. That's a fact. But what the news is, is a straight up who, what, when, where, why, and how. That's right. it. Everything else is bullshit. Well, do you remember two or three years ago, I, I can't remember when this came out, but I was really amused by it. There was a bogus story that came out, and it said that aliens were embedded into every leadership position in the government. And they wrote it yep. in a very serious tone, okay? Yeah. And and this was, this was done on... Uh, it was a Sorsha Fall website, which always starts out all of their comments like the, a you know a rumor circulating in the Kremlin today. They usually put on at the front of their paragraphs, and you know then if you read that line, that's kind of like code that this is all baloney. <laughs> it's 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 complete disinfo, and people don't know that. But that particular article about aliens being embedded in our government went completely viral. Everybody believed it, which really amazed me because that proved that we're at the point now where that kind of a discussion is believable to people. That aliens are real. That UFOs do exist. I mean, and, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, it would have been ridiculed right off off the off the face of the earth and now it's like everybody believes that this is a possibility now are you still there Well, I don't know what happened to Kaiser. I'm, I'm hoping our line is still working here. So I'll just keep talking, just in case. So in Watchers 5, we had a an experience with uh, a guy who had basically investigated the Black Eyed Children effect. And that was author David Weatherly. I remember that. Do you remember that? Are we still on? Oh yeah, we're still going. Oh yeah, we're still going strong, brother. Okay, I I didn't hear I from to, you for a I long time. To, I had to, uh, you know, the thing I had stopping by today. I had to deal with that, so we're good. Okay, don't worry about that. Brother. No problem. I didn't know if we were still connected, but anyway, um, David Weatherly had done research. And had found a lot of people that had an experience with what was known as black-eyed children. And I didn't know what to make out of this. And, and yet I expect there to be strange, unexplainable supernatural events occur 
and that they will increase in the next few years. I really totally believe that that's the case. And so I got his book and I read it and there was one particular story that really intrigued me. So I told LA, I said, I want to reenact this story of this truck driver that went across the state of Texas at three in the morning. I totally remember this. That was the one of the best shows you guys have done with Watchers, and it blew me It was Watchers 5, yeah. Let Me In. And if you talk to um, David Weatherly about it, there are certain uh, intriguing little bits of information that in several different cases, these kids that appeared at people's doors, they would they would knock funny. I mean, they would just continue like dun, 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 you know, in a very monotonous way, continue to knock on your door. Like most people would just go, you know, knock, knock, knock. Right. And you'd right. go to the door, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Not these kids. It would be different. And sometimes when that would happen, animals – the pets and stuff. Even this one guy was military guy had a German shepherd and the dog was terrified and ran and hid under the bed. And it took him like a day for them to pull him out from under the bed. Cause he was so terrified could feel the evil yep, from those kids yep. through the door. And it, you'd, you'd open the door and there would be these kids kind of in frumpled clothing and they would they would speak in in it's English, but it's not like regular English. They would ask like, "Is it food time?" Or, you know, "Can you let us in to watch television?" Or they would, I mean, it's like things you would never just go to a neighbor's house that you someone you didn't know and ask them if you could do th such a thing. Can we? Can you know? Let me in. You know? Can you let us in? Well. Also, when they looked up at you, their entire eye was black. I mean, I'm talking about the sclera, the white area around uh, the iris and all that. The whole eyeball was black. The whole show was so, on that, on that particular portion, was so freaky, brother. Uh, yeah. But it, was, it, but it was real. You could tell from the account. <laughs> I mean... Here's the, the, the reenactment I did with I used Tim, who is a really good friend of mine, and found us the perfect truck for for shooting that scene. I I think I had a four hundred dollar budget to do that whole scene right. <laughs> out in the desert, and I paid the kids. The kids were great, and they we all awesome. had so much fun. I'm gonna mute. And um, we went out there and and filmed all of this and. It really, you know, and it also I'd had a, I had just bought this camera and I wasn't sure how good it would look in total dark like that. And you can't believe how simple the lighting setup was that I used. I mean, I had uh, a car that I parked across the street and I clamped uh, an LED light onto the side window shooting across the street. And then I put a light inside of the truck. Uh, an LED light facing Tim, our actor that was the truck driver, just with some double stick tape. And then I put a light on the ground that our actor Ryan uh, stood almost on top of to shoot up at him to give him those weird shadows. And so there were three lights and the headlights of the truck, and, and that was basically it. And we're out shooting this in... Uh, near the Mojave Desert, kind of in a uh, uh, an area I outside of Lancaster, yeah. and I, I had gone out. It's about 65 miles from my house, that area, and I drove out there to find this location. And because it was so remote and so desolate, I thought it would work great, and it it really did. And but what was really interesting, I went to. Uh, my co-producer of Watchers, Terry Tilton, who's a really good friend of ours. And I said, I got to hire some child actors. And she said, what is it you're trying to do? And I explained to her, and I said, it's about the black eyed children. And she started screaming on the other end of the phone. And I said, what, what? She said, my friend, Laura, 
just had that experience. And I said, what? I mean, I at first I didn't believe it because it That's, just seemed too coincidental. It's always, there is no coincidence, brother. Uh, me, Arminius, uh, many people who listen to this program, Cold, uh, Cold Warrior, um, there are many people on my page that know there are no coincidence. Never. There think just aren't. There aren't. And you know this. Um, accidentally, you know, how we cross paths, and we're not going to get into all that, but <clears throat> what, what came uh, out of that um, is truth. And the problem is, too many people shut their minds down. They want to believe the pablum they're fed. Uh, they want to believe that this world is a way that makes them comfy. My show is comfy. I have a small group of listeners, and I always will. I will not let it grow. But the point being is that um, if I... Uh, one people on my show they'll be here and they can always express themselves vitally and disagree with me vitally because that's something I think we're losing now you and I have had so many discussions where we may disagree on this may disagree on that but we will both look at it with an open mind not so open that our brains fall out but we actually listen to each other. And that's sure. the beautiful point of America. We are Americans. We have Americana. And we practice Americanism. We are all Americans. And that's the point being. That's my two cents. Yeah, no, totally. And anyway, this I'm sending you a picture of the of the shoot that we're talking about here. It's coming up on your, on the, on your sidebar there. But this woman uh, lived in, I think she was from, uh, if I remember right, I think she lived in Minneapolis, but she was moving to Florida or something. I don't, it's been a long time, so I don't quite remember. This was 2012. But I told Terry, I said, I don't know if we have the budget to go see her, but I'd really like to talk to her. And she said, but she's coming to L.A. She'll be here next week. So we interviewed her in Watchers 5. And when L.A. showed her the picture of the front of the book that David Weatherly had written, she went and had a conniption fit. She was like, it freaked her out because that whole thing came flooding back into her memory of the of her experience that she had with this black eyed child. And it, it's uh, the fact that we found somebody without even looking for them in time for the shoot for doing watchers five, I thought was really incredible. And then we reenacted that thing with, with my friend, Tim who, and Tim works for Quentin Tarantino, by the way, nobody really knows that, but um Quentin would probably like the little segment we did because he likes that kind of stuff. But it, it's Tim did a great job. Don't worry, my outreach is so small that there's <laughs> probably nobody that knows uh, Quentin Tarantino, and that's okay. Like I said, he has his issues, but yeah, <laughs> he uh, yeah, I was fortunate to be able to go out and meet you in L.A. in person. And uh, I just decided to go out and talk to you guys and about something that was important. And uh, you know, we were happy to meet you too. And that wasn't by chance either. I mean, for the no, fact that you're listening yeah. to me on the radio and and we talk afterwards, um, I thought that was really something. Wow, so. Jermaine brought some up that is so blown away. When I say this, you're going to be like, yep, Shuff, Kaiser, you're right. Uh, Jermaine Arminius, he is on it. I'm telling you, from Germany, he is so on it. And he's he listening from Germany oh, right now? He is right now, yeah. He is, <laughs> well, hi there. He's a brother of mine 
from many years ago. Uh, that's all we'll say. Uh, and he said, John Carpenter's They Live is a point in the 80s to bring it on point. And he said, check it. And he said, thank you, Richard Shaw. Uh, that's kind of interesting that Hollywood, and we'll talk about this, I'm going to have to mute. You there, Richard? Because I'm here. I had to mute. I had to. I have to mute right now. Oh, okay. Um, didn't know if we'd lost. I mean, sometimes the internet is goofy and you lose lose connections. But the, the weird thing about Hollywood is that it's very diverse. A lot of these really brilliant people don't understand what's going on with Trump, and they they take the left view and they believe the media and all of that, and yet. They have brilliant minds. They're computer programmers. They do incredible 3D animation. And and I have friends out here that are, are totally fine, including um, Bob Williams, who built the original Terminator robot and worked on um, so many huge hit films. Uh, worked on the the Great Wall with Matt Damon in China. He was there for like eight months. He's on a film right now in Jordan. So he's in Amman, Jordan, and he FaceTimed me just uh, a few days ago to show me what his hotel looked like. And so he's over there. He's also going to shoot something for me that I've asked him to shoot while he has a, a digital film camera, which is really saving me thousands of dollars with not with me not having to travel to Jordan to get this shot, so I really appreciate Bob, and he's he's a consummate Hollywood professional, going way back to the original Terminator, uh, where they had to make all that that robot work, and Bob built the hand and arm and head of the robot, and. In fact, in Watchers 5, he, he brought the arm because I begged him to bring it in so I could shoot it and play with it. And so he did. So I have I have really fun friends to work with. <laughs> I really do. You included. But, I mean, these folks are really smart. They're not stupid. And yet there is this strange fog that hangs over Hollywood that makes a lot of it lean to the left quite heavily and yet they turn out a movie like like what just came out recently um, I don't know if you're into animation but I, I always thought that one of the best animated films I'd ever seen was The Incredibles and they just came out with Incredibles 2 and I thought how could they possibly do a better job and it's it's such a well done film and you know there's no politics in it you know, or anything like that. It's just, it's just really well done. So, it, it, while there's really evil people in Hollywood doing evil things, and we've all read about all of those things recently, the 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 pedophilia that that apparently has been going on for decades, it's not across the board. There's people that are still doing good stuff out here, and I just want to stand up for the people that have value still and not the ones that are doing the terrible stuff. So, you know, we, we live in a, in a fallen world. We live in a place that sometimes it feels like we're living in a – wallowing in a cesspool with all the stuff that's going on. But we just have to keep our wits about us and try to do the best we can. And I'm pushing this – Watcher series because I I'm, I get excited when people see it because I think it will open their hearts to things that they've wondered about and and this isn't like we've tried our best and I know you know this but we've tried our best to keep it as scientific and as factual as possible as far as we can go to vet all of these things oh yeah clear you guys clear you know we've really worked hard at doing yeah. that. You guys bet everything that comes through any of the watchers. You and L.A. both. And, and uh, we've, we've done all of this work with the skulls in Peru. Yeah. And, and we have really fascinating... We know a lot about it now. 
we, which, between the two of us, which, we know a lot about it. Which blows, and the Peru, I had a picture of you in Peru with stuff that was going on uh, when you did that one show. Uh, now I've got a fireside chat thing ha hanging. But the interesting part to me that people don't understand is how you vet people, and I know how you vet them, it's because you demand evidence. You demand different things to know. And then, even if you got that evidence, you want to know and collect other people that accidentally may show up. And you know what I'm talking about on that. You want confirmation that this is you're not being fed a line of bullshit. Well, sure. And yeah. remember... Uh, there's this series of movies, Indiana Jones, that came out, Spielberg did, along with Lucas. And the last one that they did was called Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Crystal Skulls. Remember that? And that came out a year or two before we decided to go to Peru for ourselves. Oh, now, yeah. we, weren't look we, weren't, we weren't looking for Crystal Skull or anything like that, but we were. we did have this lead that there were places we could go to actually examine uh, skeletons that had elongated skulls and wondering if that might be uh, evidence of giants at one time or at least the Nephilim as, as spoken of in ancient texts, uh, specifically in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis and the Torah talks about these giants. But that's not the only historical reference that there is on the giants. And so, the well, first time we went, um, you're exactly it right. was uh, it was incredible. I mean, we were shown this graveyard that was seven miles wide. Yeah. It had a, a tumbled down pyramid uh, that was built by the Incas that was still there, falling apart. And then, in one area of the of the city, uh, of this of this gigantic graveyard, it's called the Changos Necropolis. There were just bones laying on the surface of the ground. On the ground. On the ground, there was uh, mummy wrappings blowing in the wind. And this stuff was just like laying there. And then we found out that it was the Waikara, yeah. who are grave robbers. Yep. What they do, they have these long steel rods with a T-bar that they've welded on at the end. And they plunge this into the ground until they feel something. And then they dig it up. Yep. And they aren't interested in the skulls. They're looking for ancient pottery or copper or, you know, valuables That's, that might have been buried with yeah. these people, okay? Yeah. So they just toss the heads out on the surface. Yeah. And a lot of these ended up in, a, in Paracas at a museum there that was put together by Senior Juan, who became a friend of ours, who's now passed away. Right, I remember. But but senior so that's the fifth person that's passed away in this series just since we finished doing this series in 2017. We were talking about that last night. <laughs> yeah, he's another one I forgot yeah. had passed away. I mean, so many people have died. Doctor Lear has passed away. Chuck Misler. Yep. Um, we we've had uh, Chris Putnam who co-wrote a book with Tom Horan passed away. Um. Dame Isabel Pixek, who was one of the proponents, she's a particle physicist that worked on the Shroud of Turin, uh, died in two, in 2016. And then we had uh, Senior Juan, who, I mean, so these people aren't available for interviews anymore. I know. We man. did the we did the last important interviews that anyone will ever see of them, and it's it's in this series. And then what happens? L.A.'s house catches on fire, wow. and he had a two-car garage, yep. and the two-car garage was full of all of our work that we'd done together and a lot of his own stuff, too, that he's done since then. Yeah. And it was all turned to complete white ash. I was and, over there the other day and looked at it. And explain, remember I told you what to look for, uh, this whole conspiracy theory for new weapons, Jermaine don't know about this, um... Uh, 
there's a lot about that on the internet right now that yeah. people think that you know these fires were not natural. I mean, we're talking heat that was so great that he had two kind of vintage Mercedes that he liked to drive around they in. Were they were lovely. like ninety, ninety one and ninety two Mercedes. And I've been to his uh, house, folks. <laughs> yeah, and and his the wheels on these Mercedes had melted and ran down the driveway like yeah. they had been smelted, yeah. and the tires there was no evidence that tires had ever been on these cars. All right. that was left was just the steel belts just kind of strung together. And what did I tell you to look for? Well, we we I know like these these do weapons. Yeah, the yeah for that. What did I tell you? I said, look. To they see tend to the eat the glass belts. out, and yeah, yeah. And the still well, that's belts, what happened. Still belts will be still whole, and the Germain Ar Ar Arminius Richard. That's Shaw, true. That's exactly what we found because yeah. I wanted to go over there and, and inspect it after we had that discussion, and that's the case. I wanted to get there. Uh, Germain Arminius wrote Richard Shaw. We have all in point is to w wake up to our own spirit. In one second, we can take all information because it is our roots, information, and open mind to find out. And he said, it is not thinking, mate. It is fake, not natural. And we know this instinctually. This is why I love talking. This is the first time I've been able to interview Richard Shaw. This man is probably one of the best men I've ever met. And I mean that. <laughs> and there's a lot of great men. No, you don't understand where I'm placing you because Jermaine does. There are a lot of people. When I say a great man, I'm not a great man. I'm, I'm just... I don't know how to put it to you. Jermaine can tell you the same thing. Uh, I'm not a great man. Nobody will ever say that about me. Um, I'm just the guy that force gumps myself through this planet and gets captured everywhere. Trust me, I'm the most famous person that nobody's ever met because I tell the truth. And... Uh, Unfortunately, I've been captured in the Gulf War, my first war, all the way everywhere I've been. Some TV channel, somebody has captured me. And it actually, uh, one time, and uh, I think I told you about this, I'm not going to get into details, but I even got captured in a, a place I shouldn't have gotten captured in, in Brussels, one time. You know, oh, hmm. so yeah, I made the papers that in Djibouti. So, anyways, it is what it is. But we had heard when we were in Peru that some of those big Nephilim skulls had been smuggled out and were sent to Brussels. Well, because they're doing really some kind of that. weird, they're doing some kind of weird occultic ritual with them. You know, and and this is don't know nothing about. This is not the not the first time I've heard about stuff like that. But I'm just talking about. I mean, all I'm saying is that wrong. Watchers and everything, all of the singles of the DVDs. I mean, and this is a. I mean, none of you guys know what we go through to produce this stuff. But when you have one episode, I, the the least we can press is a thousand copies. And that ends up in 30 boxes to hold all those DVDs. Well, we have 11 Watchers episodes, essentially. There's Watchers 10 and Watchers 10.2. 10.2 was an, a, a continuation of Watchers yep. 10, for which we never charged anyone for that release. We gave it away. If you bought Watchers 10, you got 10.2 for free. And we did that because we felt we needed to explain what what the fairy was all about and to prove that it was fake. Because that's what we try to do is we're trying to bring the truth out about these things. That's right. So yeah. that it doesn't end up being, you know, an urban legend about the fairy. It's not a fairy. It was actually built by someone who's really good at it. was good at it. Yeah, I remember yeah. seeing that. So we, anyway... 
all of these episodes, fortunately, because we were running low on them at the time before the fire, were being repressed over at Advanced Digital Systems in Hollywood by our good friend Mary Pat Avery, who's been doing this for us for years now. And coincidentally, Thursday is the day they're supposed to be delivered to L.A.'s rented house now. He's moved to um, Thousand Oaks, and they're supposed to be delivered today. So we'll actually have product to sell because all of our income went to zero because of the fire. An undisclosed location. but you An guys undisclosed location. Yeah. It's a big city. Yeah. You, you but guys, anyway. You guys are awesome. Always. Any, anyway, we're... We're glad to be able to pitch this again and be sure to watch the promo that's up on my website or or however you've done that. Kaiser is fine. But I want people to know about Watchers and I'd like for them to get the series. And it's it's streaming too if you'd rather just stream it. It's a little less expensive if you stream. But if you want like the whole set, it's really a good deal. It's just under $100 for... 11 DVDs. Well, I can tell you, uh, Watchers, um, as far as I know, even one time, you know, they tried to fool them with the fairies. You're not going to do that to these folks. They're going to keep researching. Ain't nobody getting no bullshit over on them. And on my page, I will tell you, folks, and we're talking... It's funny, we're talking internationally to a couple people. And uh, those people will make sure to push this out on their channels. Because they're the only people that can actually see my stuff in certain countries because of what I had to do. Right. And, uh, you know... Well, if you, if you go to the Pinlight site, there's links to everything. They'll yes. just say that. I'm yes. not going to be super silly about it, but we do need people's help to keep us from, you know, everything from collapsing while we try to regroup and, and do all this. But yeah, Watchers is a series that I really feel is important because so much effort was spent on it, and it's it's all as as truthful as we knew how to produce it. And, I, you know, I get these naysayers on YouTube. Oh, that was all fake. Why are you guys even talking about it? And I, I write back to these people saying, because we wanted to prove it was fake. Yes. And that and that's, that's the, the whole point. point. You guys are like uh, James Randi. You guys will prove somebody a fake. Without, it doesn't matter if they're a friend or not. If they are throwing something bullshit at you. You will out them. And that's why I respect you. Um, there's a lot Well, of there's a tremendous why. amount of fakery out there. And I it's know. like, you know, there's people talking about the secret space program, that they've been to other planets and all of this stuff. And, yeah. you know, it, one part of me thinks, well, maybe there is. You know, it's like I, I don't want to just immediately discount all of that as that right. it's not possible. Because it might be. But the problem is there's no way to vet it. Yeah. There's no way to take what these people are saying and prove that they've actually been to all these places. Uh, you know, uh, there's Bob Lazar who made some incredible claims way back in the late 80s. But I believe Bob Lazar. I, I don't think he was lying to us. All of his stuff made sense to me that he was saying and I think there's a film coming out about him uh, in the next couple of weeks. But um, Area 51 and uh, all of that stuff ended up in Independence Day back in 1996, partially due to the stuff that Bob Lazar had said. And, and it's because, look, I am the biggest dude that will say that is totally unbelievable. And I'm also the biggest dude to say one thing in my life. Well, actually, two things. I'll tell you the second thing. I won't say the first. Are totally un unbelievable. One is on Okinawa, Japan. 
I get called to, and I, I know I've shared this before, numerous times on Art Bell one time openly. And I get called to, and I, I was brand new to Okinawa, Japan, Camp Kenzer. Uh -huh. And on Camp Kenzer, we had these warehouses, and it used to be a zero uh, landing strip. There's a certain point that's very straight, and that's where those zeros landed. But we built warehouses there. And they were all cold storage from Vietnam uh, mm -hmm. for people coming back after the war that are dead. Okay? And I come rolling up as, you know, cool ass MP, don't know shit yet for this place. You know, I'd been in the Gulf War, but whatever. I'm, I'm still a cunt. And I come up and there's this black dude that's ash gray. <laughs> And there's this white dude that looks like, <laughs> I can't even explain how white he was. And uh, they're like, there's something in there. And, and they're both mumbling through their words. I'm like, I'm going in. These security guys for PWR, was pre-position war reserve. I'm going into the warehouse, see what's going on. And they were like, he's down this aisle, dude. And, and so I go running, you know, like I should have stayed outside and never seen this. Honestly, I mean this. I should have just caught it in and just been a dork. You know, that's what I should have done. But no, I'm a dumbass. So I go running down <laughs> the aisles. They tell me to run. And I come out towards the back with all these boxes stacked up and all this stuff. And all of a sudden... I, and this is on Art Bell, folks. This is when he had his show, his last show. I told yeah. the same story. You're not going to hear a variance because it's the truth. And I come out the end, and this thing looks over at me from the waist up, looked like a human being, shape-wise, not like a real human being. And it was like mist. And he like turns to me, looks at me, and all of a sudden, he turns around and goes through this freezer door. A still freezer door. I'll never forget it. And, of course, what do I do? I should have just stopped there and just said, oh, it's a figment of my imagination. It looked like smoke is what it looked like, actually. Uh -huh. and, and I opened that door, ripped it open, and this thing, I have a full body look at it. And he looks at me and just, he's gone. Like vapor. What did he look like? Uh, I don't know. I, he just looked like a shape. A human shape. Arms. And, and where was this again? Okinawa, Japan. Camp Cancer. Huh. Um, that's on Okinawa. It's was this after Fukushima? No, it was before. It was this before. Is back in after the Gulf War, brother. My last oh, year okay. was spent in the nineties, Japan. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know that's where they stored the bodies. I didn't know any of that. And then uh, my gunnery sergeant comes up, and I I come out. No, I'm not ghost white. I <laughs> those two guys are still ash gray and ghost white. And I'm coming out, and I'm like, this is so cool. You got to hear this gun. And he goes, okay, shove. Let me tell you something. He goes, this is where they use to store bodies from Vietnam. They're going to see this all the time. So from now on, when you come in, don't get on the radio saying, that's so fucking cool. I just saw this. He goes, no. Just realize, go up there, take the report of, you know, a false alarm and that's how we handled that yeah yeah but no uh, my first time i was like this is wild i cannot believe this shit. well there's you know there's people and, and and i'll leave i'll leave it this with you because uh in april of 2017 i was asked to uh basically appear at the Sonoma Film Festival with Watcher 7 and screen it for a bunch of people who was interested in UFOs. So I agreed to do that. I drove up there, and I didn't know 
you know, it's it's mostly like new agers and folks like that that are really interested in this stuff. And I and I love talking to them because in most cases they take this more seriously than the churches ever do. And so we showed the film, and we were oh, I was shit, on a panel. I didn't take with, it serious at all. I'm being yeah, honest. Yeah, and 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 I showed the film and the we, we, to. Full House, and afterwards we did a panel discussion, and Stephen Bassett was on the panel. He's a friend of mine. He's like, a, he's a lobbyist for disclosure in D.C. Uh, he's lived this. He wants the truth to come out, and and I was telling him even at the time, I said I, I wouldn't count on Podesta and all those guys, but I think Trump, if if there's something going to happen, Trump will do it. And of course, he didn't believe me, but. I really think that you know we're close to some kind of disclosure, and all those folks would not leave. They Trump. were there all afternoon for five hours Trump. wanting to talk about this, and I had people coming up to me telling me they'd seen aliens. I had a woman telling me that she was that she had seen one of those insectoid beings, like what's in Watchers Nine that I. Uh, highlighted that was on the Kambergas UFO from uh, Istanbul, essentially, um, that there's actual photographic proof that they exist. And I've had two people now tell me that they've had experiences with these aliens that look like praying mantises. Now, I'm not asking them to tell me this stuff. Yeah. I'm not trying to draw them out or put words in their mouth, but people will tell me I've seen a creature just like that. Uh, one of them the was in like almost like a near death experience kind of thing where the guy had a really high temperature and this creature gave him some sort of uh, cream that he put on his face and he woke up and his fever had broken. And and he was he remembers it because it was so profound looking, and this woman that I had met uh, after Watcher Seven had had a similar. She wasn't like sick, but she remembered she was approached by one of these weird beings. So, you know why we can't see them and all that. If this is a digital sim simulation, that would kind of uh, cause some of this stuff to make more sense. Um, that the software could be tweaked and people are being, you know, but I know people who've been abducted. I know people who've had really smart people in the military that have been on ships. Um, all of this stuff is not just make believe this is real and I can vouch for it. Then it's real. What I can't vouch for are people that say that they lived on other planets and they were, you know, brought back here because there's no way I can tell for sure that that really happened to them. But I'm telling you, some of the stories that are out there are getting pretty believable. Well, the, and we have to we have to kind of keep an open mind and and not uh, abuse these people when they give you their stories, but try to find out if there's any semblance of truth to these stories so that we can get to the bottom of it. Well, here's the whole point of. In the end, I'm going to tell you what it's about. It's about control. Uh, sure. When people have to sign non-disclosure agreements, uh, when people have to uh, be forced to do things, um, we're seeing it now. This is why what you said was so epic. Trump is going to, he's got to, for his political health, he has to put this stuff out. Yeah. And it's for real. And he will do this because he has the ability. He is the ultimate declassifier. Every president is. And remember Obama with Stephen Greer. Here's why... I'm not a fan of Stephen Greer. And I'll tell you why. He's like, well, Obama this, Obama that. Obama didn't do shit. Neither did Clinton. <laughs> neither did Bush W. 
And neither did, well, nobody should have expected G.H.W. Bush to do This it. is why they all hate Trump so much, because Trump's actually because in there kicking actually butt. he's doing it. He's yeah, he's actually, actually doing, doing it. And, and everyone's opposing him. Yeah. And he's a fighter. I, I almost like sometimes I think he loves it. He does, because he's you know? a Manhattan Democrat. Look, I was, you know my backstory. <laughs> I was a actual communist. And I fell in love with my nation. When I saw what communism was in East Germany. That's the problem. We no longer have a wall in Europe where people can see white people being degraded and being defiled. This is honestly what it is. They, they just say, oh, it's the brown people, the black people, this, that, and the other. No, it's not. It's happened before, but you can do it better. No, you can't. And it's not until you see that that yeah. you might wake up. And these people, that, oh, well, uh... Uh, Acacia well, Cortez, it, she has it's it a all form of, going on. Oh my gosh, she is it's like... It's all mind control. She's just as dumb as a rock. I can't oh, believe it. But, but there are people that... I'm telling you, brother, I was that dumb. I was 17, thank God, by the time I was 18 in Europe, in Berlin. I woke mm. up. I yeah. It, it's a that. form we're we're under a form of mind control really from all of the networks because it's so pervasive people begin to think well it's got to be true because it's everywhere and, and this other stuff seems fringe so it, it makes everything else seems like it's not real and actually it's the fringe stuff that's more real than the than the mainstream stuff it's really crazy you're fucking a right <laughs> it, it, it blows me away. It, look, I have to use sometimes shocking language to make my point. My point being is everybody knows who I am. I'm out there on a lot of different levels. And I'm also on the no-fly list. Although the federal government had no problem letting me fly to Afghanistan a couple months back. Again. <laughs> Um, I'm also on the terrorist watch list. Although that's, you know, nebulous, whatever. <laughs> but see, I, well, I don't care. They had me on one a long time ago, and, and I don't know why, because I hadn't done anything yet. Well, you know, there was not, nothing that... Not I wasn't even to. involved in watchers at the time. So not, they just... They just throw people's names on there. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Oh, no, no, no. It, I got a visit. I they know just screw why. up. I know why. I got a visit, and they thought I was bodyguarding a piece of shit that I wasn't bodyguard. I know exactly why. I mean, <laughs> I know why. That, and, and, of course, when they visit, they're like, well, we, we're shocked. Why, are you, why were you there? Well, a protest is illegal now? No, it's not. Okay, we don't care about your politics, and this is my favorite part of this. I love doing this right now. One of the guys from a county who knew, you know, who I knew about, and this, that, and the other, it's nearby because they always use locals because in my state, uh, right. uh, the federal government's pretty well constrained, as it should be, by our constitution for our state and by our nation. <clears throat> uh-huh. So this guy's like, why are we there, this, that, and the other? And, and I looked at him, I said, well... I know you know a brother of mine. And he looks at me, and the other guy from the city, one guy's county, one guy's city, the guy from the city looks at me all queer-eyed, but I knew who he was. I mean, look, my city where I grew up, it was called the largest small town in America. And the funniest part was hilarious. I knew who he was, and I knew the other guy, too. But there's a difference in that, and I'm not going to get into it. But I said, oh, so you know my brother, and I gave his name. And he goes, oh, you mean... 
And just like he said, and I know they were recording it, and so when I said that, it'll come up in their recording without saying a word. And I'm like, yeah. I said, next time, you, and I looked over at the Columbus, or the city guy, and I go, next time you call me a racist, I said, you better understand, that man is an actual American Indian. And my mother was like his mother. His mother was like my mother. So you call me a racist again, we're going to have a problem. See, this is the thing. Sure. We're Americans. We can shut this shit down if we tell them to shut the fuck up and quit calling us arbitrary names. Right. Because right. you happen to go somewhere that somebody says, oh, he's a racist. Fuck you. You don't get to call <laughs> me what I am. I know what I am, and you don't. That's why I know it, with their three-eighths inch thick file on me, they didn't know shit. Because they don't know, and they're... All, both of their eyes were bug-eyed. Fuck them. And people in America need to realize all this racism, all this bullshit, you need to shut it down now. Yeah, it's it's tearing the country apart. It's, it's all intentional for, yes, for that is. very purpose. Yes, it is, brother. Anyways, I didn't want to hijack your thing. Hijack. Just... You hit a hot button with me, brother. And <laughs> I just, I couldn't believe, and we have talked about this offline. And, I, you know, I've said probably too much, but it is a fact. And people, look, they're trying to divide us to conquer us. Don't let them do that. And I mean that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Okay. So, anyways, um, that that's why I thought I would start focusing on doing a series of talks. If anyone's interested, I would consider doing this. That's just reading near-death experiences of people that have really had this experience, and just it, it could be like bedtime stories at night. You could be listening to this because it's so incredible what's happening, what's coming out. And Dr. Jeffrey Long has a website that has over 4,100 stories of people that have had this experience. And I think it's an important development. And so instead of talking about getting where politics can be so divisive, I thought I would just take the, a totally different approach and, and do that. So I've been considering whether I would do something like that and if i get enough people that think they, they would tell me they would listen to it i probably would do it that's beautiful and if you need somebody to tell the whole story because i've already told you what i know is happening um i'll fill you in on everything brother because look what i do know about watchers what i do know about Richard and LA they saved my marriage because <laughs> I know you guys know where my head was at at a certain point I wanted to protect everybody and get away from it and I almost destroyed everything you guys gave prayers you guys gave everything to me well, we didn't do anything other than what we normally would want to do. That's right. And You've proved yourselves, as I did. Well, thank you, and we were glad to do it. Sorry, I didn't mean to hijack that. Just go on and share your idea on what to do, how to fix this, because with all my schooling, I can't. I tried. I've been trying. Well, 
we have to get back to the basics and we have to get back to not ridiculing God and and Christ and thinking it's some kind of Catholic deal. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, anything to um, destroy people's faith, not call Christmas, you know, calling it happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. I mean, Trump is even against doing that. And, and it's just one way of watering the truth down in people's minds so they can't, they're afraid to even say things that are truthful. And we can't be politically correct or else we're going to get sucked into the whole vortex of the mainstream media has gotten sucked into. And I know you're not that way, and neither and neither the, am I. You know, I'm not out here to to start a fight with anybody, but I'm here just to say what I believe and and not uh, be embarrassed to do that. So I think we all just have to have to be that way, especially now. And and I don't know. It seems like we've gone really overtime on your show here, but um, I appreciate getting to be on with you and getting to discuss all this stuff. You've been a great host and I, I appreciate it, Kaiser. Sorry about that. My wife just walked in. The dogs are going hold on, hold on. Keep talking. <laughs> well, it sounds like you got... Um, a lot going on there, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna be signing off here in a second because I have stuff I have to do too, okay, and it's been great to be great to be with you. The wife just put him outside. She got in. Uh, my beautiful bride. I chose her. Uh, here's the thing, <laughs> folks. Uh, go look to L.A. Marzulli. Honestly. There are people trying to defile him, saying he's a millionaire. No. Oh, it's, it's so all, stupid. It's all bullshit. He built that out of hard scrabble. And, uh. Well, like I was saying to you before we got on today, that L.A. has lived in Malibu since the 70s. And, yep. and people that, that know anything about Malibu know that, like, Back in the 50s and 60s, it was just basically an incredibly rural area. I mean, Pacific Coast Highway was like a two-lane road, and you know, it was all mountainous and stuff like that. And they used to they used to shoot scenes for from Perry Mason back yep. in 1957. <laughs> and you look at the place, and I can tell where they're shooting because I've been there, and it's like, wow, look how completely remote Malibu looks. So. It, it's only just been in the last few decades that it's gotten to be this, you know, place for celebrity retreats and stuff like that. Yeah. And so L.A. bought his house back in the 70s yeah. and expanded on it, built a guest house and a garage with and planted vineyard and with his own hands. Yeah, he, so all this stuff he built. And he, well, he can't help that the property value went up because everything in Malibu went up. But yeah, he's not a millionaire. No, he's not. He still, and owns a, he, he still you know, has a, a loan to pay off on that place. So it's like, you know, I'm glad he's done so well on GoFundMe because he needs it. Hell yeah. And and he's, he's lost everything. The guy's lost everything. And he's a regular guy. That's the yeah. thing. Just like with you, Richard. It boggles my mind that these people want to impugn you and him. This really disturbs me. Just because. Oh, I'm maybe... I'm kind of used to it. I I, I get these. Uh, you know, when someone writes a rebuttal against something I've put up, what that I know is true, then I just beat him back with the facts. You know, I, I'm not going to get in an argument. But I'm saying, here's what really is the deal. You yeah. know. We did actual genetics testing at, at this lab in Canada, or we actually proved that this was a particular haplogroup. You know, we're talking about these skulls. Yeah. Or we had, like, guys come in who who 
w- what I think was really interesting was when, and I we're probably way over time here on your show. I no, don't know we're where. Not. The, no, we can go as long as but, you want to go, brother. This but, is just like one of our normal chats on Skype. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, it's like we good. we did a, a thing about the elongated skulls. We did DNA evidence on February second of this year, in uh, at at the. Uh, where was it? The Marriott, I guess, in in downtown uh, Los Angeles, right by the airport. And we showed like all of the evidence. And then, if when you turn these skulls upside down and you look at the foramen magnum and the foramen ovalis, and what all all this is is basically the foramen magnum is the big opening on the in, bottom of the skull where the spinal column and all of those uh, nerve endings pass through the spinal cord and up into the brain and make those connections well in the elongated heads it's in a totally different spot than it is on a human skull and also the foramen ovalis and these other little holes that are underneath the bottom of the skull there allow blood vessels in to feed uh, and nerves uh, in to feed like muscles on your cheeks and in your face and around your eyes and all of that. All that's control. It's really complicated stuff. But the elongated heads had completely different ports underneath where this stuff existed, which blows the whole theory that they were cradle headboarded that way. Now, there were some that were. Yeah, I remember and that. so experienced at this, we can look at it and go, oh, that's cradle headboard. Look at the dent on the side of the head or look at his forehead. I mean, that was intentionally molded that way through time. And, and we know what that looks like. And we can, we you know, we were given heads like that to examine. And, and as soon as we saw that, we go, well, that's not really a natural skull. That's that's a cradle headboard skull. And, and now we know the difference between the two. And you can't... If you tried to move the foramen magnum that far, you'd kill the person. That was one of those things that people who haven't been to L.A.'s studio or his house would never know how much you guys collected knowledgeably. uh, knowledgeably. Um, You guys collected many things and it wasn't just those things but you made cast of things and you had the head borders and you had also the other heads yeah and, and we've seen what the hardware about. looked like yeah. in those days because you know uh, senior one had the you know, what's kind of a woven piece of string that they would tie the head down with and how it fit and all of that. It made total sense when he showed it to us. But right. but when we un- unwrapped the baby mummy, to me that was the most important thing we did in Peru was unwrapping the baby mummy skull because it just showed that this kid couldn't have been cradle headboarded. He wasn't old enough. He was like 18 to 24 months old right. and probably 22 months old because uh, we could tell from – from the dental dental records. I mean, he still had his baby teeth. Yeah. yeah. It, and it takes like three years to cradle headboard somebody. And yeah. this, this person was already had a huge head. Yeah, it blows everything away. And, yeah. and that's the whole thing is you guys are actually searching for the truth. Other people act like they are. They think they know stuff. The really thing, the big thing... The big thing that gets me is all these people will act like they know what they're doing, except you guys have put the investment of time and energy and actually going, look, anybody can say what they want. I could say I read a book and it's all about this, that, and the other. No, the reality is, unless I've been there, done that, put my two feet on the ground I don't know shit well this is why armchair critics I just I can't take them seriously because they haven't walked in our shoes they haven't walked through the Chongos necropolis as many times as we have and just picked these skulls up with their hands and looked at them I mean we've done that so 
this is not just like, hey, I'm making a film and I'm trying to make this point a certain way uh, to boost L.A.'s theory or anything like that. Hell! Because really, we didn't know if you guys uh, would have what found... to call this stuff at first. I mean, we had to we had to find out for ourselves. If you guys would have found something that totally contradicted your thoughts, I know you guys. Here's the, here's the difference, folks. I know these guys. If they would have found something contrary to me, I'd be the first one out. Same thing with the fairy thing. I'd be the first one, or that person would be the first one out. And the same thing with everything else. They're the first one out. They will explain, well, sorry folks, we misled you because of this person. And that is respect. That is honor. And that is how it should be. You know, there's just too many people that will not stand on their petard and say the truth. And unfortunately, in our climate we have now, everybody wants to ass rape everybody else, troll everybody else. Trust me, I'm, I'm, I, I go for the long troll. I have, I trolled for a while on certain things, and uh, because I had to, I had to do what I had to do to get Trump in office. Guess what? That's the only reason I trolled, and I'm sure there's more than me that did that, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> well. I I think uh, that what Trump's doing is necessary, and the reason he got elected was because we couldn't trust anybody else. They were all part of the whole cabal of of guys that constantly get into office. I mean, it's the Bush Clinton Bush Clinton thing. You know, it's like getting ridiculous. And I think I think half of America realized that and said, "Hey, we're getting played here." And Trump couldn't get played because he was a billionaire. No one could could uh, really intimidate him because of that, and and there are private websites that have gone up that list all the accomplishments that President Trump has made because the mainstream media won't tell it. They're being people truthful. don't know. They're, that's right. They're being truthful. Two people said something. I, uh, Ivy Ramirez. Three people. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ivy, for stopping by. Next one that I'll say is Val said, good show today, over two hours. Big thumbs up. <laughs> uh, and it is over two hours. And Richard actually canceled a show to come on mine. So that's what's happening. Uh, Jermaine Arminius, my brother from Germany. And he's known me for many years since the Cold War actually um, we are wake up in steps but it is the only way to put our eyes my proof is all in the outdoors and what he means by that is the ancestors want us to spend more time outdoors I know what he's talking about he has great English when I interview him, but you have to understand, just like me writing in German, I suck at it. Oh, and, yeah, no, I well, I couldn't do it at all, in, yeah. in period. But uh, have, did anyone ask us any questions that I could answer? Well, uh, one did at Richard, uh, Richard Shaw, seems to me you are a loyal, honorable man. Cheers. Um... Oh, this is a good one. This actually came from Jermaine. I missed it because I probably stepped away when the dogs were barking and whatnot. <laughs> we, are, we are one and not let Zeus separate us from illusions. My day is winter's... Awesome. Okay, yeah, and not Santa. Um, he's saying our day is winter, uh, the winter sun. 
and not Santa. Um, for everybody, it is the best way learning from the past to understand, overstand the plans that make your own. To make your own. Let me rephrase that. That's from Jermaine. So, yeah, I, I get where he's coming from on that. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. Sometimes I have to read things, but he 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 he's on my page guys we talked and uh you'll see his english is better than mine sometimes so <laughs> it, it's a fact and i i would hate to be on his page when we're talking because my written german would be people would be laughing at me but he at least is understood on my page. So, there you go. Um, it's a fact. He's he's a hell of a fellow well met. And I mean, oh, Ivy Ramirez just gave hand claps to Jermaine's stuff. That's awesome. So, you guys do understand. See, I like having a small, cozy place where we all get together. And uh, the people that talk about stuff, everybody knows we're trying to be honest. And... Sure. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, I want to close this out. I will close this out right now. Um, all you folks need to realize, try to support L.A. and Penlight. I put links in the description. This is what Thank you. needs to happen because these are good men. And uh, honestly, I I don't know how to uh, do anything other than be honest. So on certain things. Well, if you go to the Pinlight site and you click on projects, you'll see the the new. Uh, it's like a promo for the whole Watcher series. And then below that are each uh, of the trailers for each episode. And if you if you can't afford the whole series, I understand that. You can, you can stream and pay for the stream for any episode that you might want to look at. I mean, like if you want to see the one with the Black Eyed Kids, that's Watchers 5. You know, if you want to see the UFO special, that was Watcher 7. If you want to see our first episode in Peru, that's Redo that, brother, because I just noticed that uh, I froze for a minute. So the watchers thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah just I was just saying, go to uh, pinlight dot com. P i n l i g h t. I think you put a link up for me. I did. Um, and hit the button for projects okay. at the top. If you want to see what L.A.'s house looks like, it'll be the first thing that comes up. But the next page over is all about Watchers, and it has links for all the streaming of each individual episode, and it has uh, a link to for ordering the whole thing from L.A. because uh, they're supposed to come in. New copies are supposed to be pressed and delivered today. So, you know, if the storms out here in L.A. don't cause any delays, then, then we should have a whole thousand new sets and every time we we press these sets we have to press 11,000 DVDs and they have to be
put in boxes with 11 DVDs in each box. So it's a big freaking deal for us to do this. So um, we wouldn't do it if we didn't think it was valuable information. Yep. Uh, Val said, I hope Richard can come back soon. Uh, no, thank you said, very much. Thanks for trying to help. Jermaine said, I honor all, you all, all you guys. Bring all stuff in the description. We will share it into the world. That's <laughs> from Germany. Go on. Fantastic. Um, we did drop off for a minute, but at this point, folks, I'm going to... Uh, I'll keep Richard on. I'm going to mute everything. Uh, I'll talk to him after this. Yeah, and, uh, and I will I'll let you go, and I, thanks for having me on today. All right. God bless, brother. Um, you I'm too. I'm going to give the outro song right now, and it is the same as the intro song. It's uh, Inside Enemy Headquarters. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, my God.